Thank you. It's my great pleasure to moderate this important first session about the importance of data. Um, as we start this uh, session, I just wanted to reflect a little bit. A couple of days ago, um, after the ban was lifted, uh, but I was looking at Twitter and uh, uh, Sanjeeva from Veeravarna from uh, WSO2 was tweeting about what's the effect been with regards to the flyover, the Rajagiri flyover? How do we, do we have good data about how effective it has been? Um, if you start to unpack that question, as the public, we have a tendency to complain about everything that's going on and not going right. Uh, that's our right. But we need to ask the question, how do we know that? How do we uh, understand whether this has like, been a success? What are the yardsticks, as the Honorable Kalanga Sumatamala was mentioning earlier? What are these yardsticks that we'll use to measure our achievements by? Um, so one can think about, you know, what is the data that we will use to unpack that? Can we do the traditional surveys of people standing by the roads to figure out how many vehicles are going by, what's the speed? You can think about the cost and difficulty of achieving that. But nowadays, we have another alternate data stream, which is us using our phones to get around, looking at the Google traffic data, using Pikmi and Uber to get around, and the data that is being collected about speeds of traffic. Uh, that are being moved. These are some of the important questions for the next two days about thinking about how do we incorporate these new da data sources into our thinking as well. Second, we can ask the question, you know, even if we had the data, what's a good counterfactual? When this flyover was decided, when, the, uh, when work started in mid-2016, there would have been a study done before that. Some parts of that study would have used data from the 2013 JICA study which is about three, four years old from the making of the decision of going ahead. Uh, and in that context, a whole lot of things has changed in the economy. The macroeconomic conditions have changed. Taxation policies would have changed. How would that have affected the number of roads, uh, vehicles on the roads? So we need to think about these questions about how do we use data effectively? What are the yardsticks? How do we capture more of the economy into our uh, decision-making process so that we can, as to go back to the statement, which is understand our yardsticks and uh, measure our progress. So with those introductory remarks, I'd like to uh, introduce our esteemed panel uh, that will be uh, sharing some of their thoughts. Hopefully, uh, you won't hear any more from me, and you'll hear from my esteemed colleagues. Um, uh, Prof Professor Mohan Munasinghe, uh, who is the chairman of the Presidential Expert Committee on Sustainable Sri Lanka 2030 Vision. He's gotten a little delayed, so he'll, he'll come onto stage as soon as he's here. I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Karen Fernando, Senior Research Professional, Center for Poverty Analysis, to the stage as well. Dr. Mark Landry, Regional Advisor, Health Situation and Trend Assessment, WHO Southeast Asia Regional Office. And Mr. RHWA Kumarasiri, Additional Secretary Planning Division, Ministry of National Policies and Economic Affairs. Could I please ask you to come uh, to the stage? Thank you. Please take a seat. Um, for the sake of time, um, may I ask Mr. Kumarasiri to uh, share a few thoughts about the role, importance of data from the government perspective uh, in relation to the sustainable development goals? Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I must thank uh, organizers to invite Ministry of National Policies and Economic Affairs for the first session. And, uh, Rohan Munasinghe, please. You want to start with him? Uh, yeah, why don't we start with him? That would work better. Can we have the presentation? Huh? Thank you. 10 minutes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I let me stand because it's easier to face you. Uh, it's a privilege to be talking uh, to all of you, uh, working on the sustainable development goals. And thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me. I'm here very briefly uh, to talk to you about a. Uh, initiative called the Presidential Expert Committee's Report on the Sustainable Sri Lanka 2030 Vision. And the idea here is to show you how important data is and how it fits in with the overall uh, our progress uh, towards sustainable development. If you look at this, you see that the 2030 vision process starts with information uh, we have done integration, integrated analysis, and we have identified key issues, uh, the policy options that are available, and then uh, review and implementation. And that is the process uh, of this. Now, the national sustainable development priorities and information flow out of this, and the report is in draft form. You can have a copy if you wish. Now, if you look at your SDG process, uh, or I should say our, you have data, um, indicators, targets, all the other things that go on. And hopefully, the priorities that we have identified will help to inform that process. And there is a constant process of information feedbacks. So that is why your work is extremely important and hopefully complementary to what we have done. Now, let's talk a little bit about the 2030 vision, the basic framework. Um, it's a strategic plan. It is not a political manifesto for the president. It's not a detailed national plan, because there are other bodies, like the planning ministry, so on, who are doing that. But we hope it is practical and solution-oriented. Um, it's both uh, the report and the thinking is integrated, and the ultimate goal is to build a national consensus for sustainable development. And the key vision that the president enunciated in um, 2015 at the UN General Assembly is that Sri Lanka hopes to become a sustainable upper middle income Indian Ocean hub with an economy that is prosperous, competitive, and advanced, an environment that is green and flourishing, and a society that is inclusive, harmonious, peaceful, and just. We will follow the middle path based on balanced, inclusive green growth. So, the, um, the report hopefully guides us towards this uh, balanced path and takes us from 2017 uh, or 2018 to the sustainable vision of 2030. And we, in the process, we need to transform our values, our mindsets, institutions, behaviors, and so on. Uh, we took three snapshots of time, uh, which is in 2020, then 2025, and then 2030, and gave you an idea of what we need to do to get to those points. And we assumed a basic GDP growth rate of 5 to 6%, and the population growth rate just under 2%. So the table of contents I won't go through, but very briefly, we have uh, the three clusters, which is the economy, the environment, and society, which is the main organizing um, framework. Then we have sectors like energy, agriculture, all the ministries that deal with them. And then we have, interestingly, what are called cross-cutting themes, like gender, uh, like reconciliation, uh, like uh, the uh, governance, and so on, which cut across all the other issues. Now, how is the integration done? First, we have done a, made a major effort to integrate across economy, environment, and society, which has not been done in this country before. It was a big effort because you had 40 top scientists in Sri Lanka, each expert in their own fields and with strong views, sometimes differing. But we somehow manage that integration. And then we link up the sectors, because, for example, the energy sector has economic implications, it has environmental impacts, and it has implications for society. So that has to be linked in. And then the cross-cutting themes. Reconciliation, gender, all of those have to be integrated within this framework. And I think your data um, processors also recognize this. So just take this uh, famous diagram, which you know. 
one in, uh, goal, inequality, in this diagram is linked to 12 other sustainable development goals through the targets and indicators. So it is a holistic process. You know it. I know it, but it's uh, difficult to do. Uh, okay? The devil is in the detail, as they say. And just to show you what this nexus means for uh, development globally, there is a concept called ecological footprint of humanity, which currently says that by 2030, we will need uh, the equivalent of two planets Earth to uh, sustain life as it stands on this planet. That is ecologically speaking. If we look at who is doing all of this consumption, you will see that it is the rich who consume 85% of the planet's resources, the 20 uh, richest, 20 percentile richest people in the world. And if you look at the eight richest people, they control more wealth than half the world's population, the poorest. So there's huge inequality in the consumption. Now, if you put all of these together, this is the nexus, the linkage. You see that if the rich are consuming more than one planet worth, where are the resources to help the poor? Okay? That is why we have had, since 1947, for more than 70 years, so many goals and unmet promises because and we are down now to the last leg, which is the sustainable development goals, and we have to do it for that very reason. Now, the Sri Lanka vision I set out very clearly, and the 17 sustainable development goals are, should be adapted to national needs. We pick the priorities, and it provides a framework. Remember, goals are goals. It doesn't tell you how to get there. It's just a skeleton. We need the flesh and the blood to fill it up. This is what our report tries to do, to give a complete picture. Right? And we are contributing then to the global eco-civilization of the 21st century, and we should be in the forefront of that. And thankfully, with your help, we will be one of the leading countries. Uh, just to tell you that we have a special focus on social issues, because the president is very keen on that. We know that greed, selfishness, corruption, injustice, and violence, these unethical values are driving society today. And that is leading to this economic model of maldevelopment, which is based mainly on debt and um, unequal consumption. If you think of your our ancestors, our grandparents saved uh, so that we can enjoy a good life today with their investment. But we have discovered a different truth. We are not saving, we are borrowing. So we are borrowing from our grandchildren to improve our lives, but what do we leave for our grandchildren? That is the economic model of maldevelopment. And that has led to, I'm not getting the next slide, um, stuck, ah, the environmental debt. Because of the overuse of the environment, we are running out of resources, and that, because we run out of resources, it causes more conflict, more unethical conduct. So you have a vicious circle which destroys the democratic space in which we live. So what we need to do, I'm not moving, sorry, I'm losing time because, ah, we need to expand the democratic space with stakeholder action in order to balance the economic and social and the environmental dimensions. This is what our report is trying to do. Fight for this democratic space, it is extremely important. And uh, we need the three say, major stakeholder groups, government, business, and civil society to work together for this process. Um, and finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm just finishing up. I'll show you what is this balanced, inclusive green growth path. We start with the environment and the economy. If you see uh, this process, you will see that uh, for a poor country, which is uh, low on the environmental damage side, but also low in the economy, it is at point A. A rich country is at point C. It is damaging the environment a lot, above the safe limit, but it is also a, um, rich. Now, what we need to do, the rich have to come down in their consumption level, but the 
middle-income countries like Sri Lanka have to find a path in the middle. We cannot go up the curve like the rich countries because there are not enough resources on the planet. So we have to find this inclusive green growth path to sustainable development. And that is what we are trying to do through our report. And that is shown there. So let me... Um, I'm not getting, okay. Let, let me finish by, the, in, the, in our report, we have a set of key recommendations for each of the sectors and so on. We have six recommendations because we told the, uh, the writers, please do not give us hundreds of recommendations. Focus the policymakers. So read the report, you'll see the key recommendations, but you'll also see the issues and the analysis which underlie those recommendations. And hopefully that will give you the priorities uh, that will help you guide the, the search for data, the search for targets and indicators. Thank you very much indeed for your patience. Thank you, Professor uh, Manusinga. I believe you have to leave, but I, before we let you go, I would like to use this opportunity to just maybe put in a couple of questions to you. Would that be possible? Certainly, certainly. Okay. One question that I'm using my privilege as the moderator to ask is, um, this has been fantastic work that you've done as the chairman of this committee to pull this thing to, together. There's one question that came from the floor was, when will it be available to the public? That's one, that's from the floor. The other is, I see from the list of recommendations that you have, there's one of those is a yardstick, doing better in the improving business indicators. How would we integrate that kind of thinking into the rest of the activities that go forth from this point onwards with regards to this report? That would be my question. So yeah. two questions. Can you repeat the second point you made? You had a recommendation that one of the recommendations was about country has to do better to target the improving uh, doing business indicator, the World Bank's indicator. So that was, you know, where you've set a yardstick about how the country can move forward. What would be some of the other yardsticks that the country needs to use in terms of data? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, first, uh, let me say that I'm very privileged to have uh, the speaker and the deputy speaker and many other dignitaries listening patiently to my presentation. The report was presented to the president um, one month ago, and uh, I've presented the honorable speaker and the deputy speaker also for, with a copy. It is going through a process of peer review, uh, and very shortly it will be re released to the general public for a consultative process, because we truly believe that this should be understood by people, uh, because without that ownership, we will not go forward. So that is the process, and hopefully the data process that you are engaged in will link with that and work with that overall framework. Now, on the, um, the, the key recommendations, uh, I would say that on the economic side, for up to 2020, we have been very Catholic. The debt problem is number one. We have to solve that. We have to address the unemployment issues. We have to think of where growth is going to come from. Is it, it's certainly uh, uh, linked to export-led growth. So those are all there. On the environmental side, it's very clear that we must find a green growth path so we identify the growth options which are going to be polluting and try to avoid those. And those are very clearly laid out. There are other issues like, for example, waste disposal, which are high on the priority, uh, deforestation and land management. And then uh, there are a whole set of social issues. But I would say the key one is inequality, the growing inequality in the country, but not to mention or leave out for example, uh, the health area, the education area, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, the talk about doing better business is a different facet. It's a different element of inclination. Sorry? There's an indicator for that, yes. right? So yeah. 
about? The, uh, well, we haven't identified indicators. Okay, that is your expertise, and we dare not uh, infringe on that prerogative. But we do say that business should be part of the solution. People are always blaming business, saying they are doing this and that. Maybe they are right, but let's not um, tar the entire business community because there are a few who are doing wrong, or many, whatever. There are many responsible businesses, and this doing business indicators is not just a question of environmental pollution, but across the board, because the social issues like corruption and other things come in. We are not alone in this. So we have to think of all of those, and I'm sure you will find very good indicators and targets for that purpose. Uh, does that, uh, oh, yeah, thanks. Fine. For, I will stay for a while and listen to the learned uh, presentations okay, of the others. Excellent. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, reorient then back to the rest of the panel. Um, um, each one will be making short introductory remarks, not more than uh, five minutes. Uh, why don't we start with you? Mr. Yeah, Morris. I'm from the government, and uh, the government is uh, responsible for streamlining development agenda for 2030, all uh, ministries, departments, and the uh, government agencies. And uh, with this starting, and uh, we have to come to the data. Uh, the government is responsible for collecting data, analyzing, and providing uh, for the nation. Uh, Department of Census and Statistics very recently published data in relation to, to the status of SDG indicators. It mentioned that uh, Census Department only responsible for 75 indicators. Uh, other government agencies is responsible for 131 indicators, which is more than 54% of the total. Therefore, we, we believe that Census Department only will uh, provide limited data in relation with the SDG. Therefore, our uh, friends, colleagues from the various government ministries, department, and agencies look at the indicators. We want to provide data to achieve the sustainable development goal by 2030. And now, most of the agencies are here. Therefore, I want to little concern about the, our responsibility, collecting data. Honorable uh, Deputy Speaker highlighted, we have a lot of data at the grassroots level, yes. But uh, we have to collect as well as those data and summarize, analyze, and provide it in line with the SDG 2030. Time to time, we have to collect new data. If there is not enough, uh, we have to get the support from the Census Department, and our ministry also responsible uh, since two departments, National Planning Department as well as uh, Census Department coming under our purview. Therefore, we are also responsible, work with all the government agencies to collect the data and analyze, provide, uh, to measure where we are. Honorable Speaker also mentioned that to analyze ourselves, where we are right now and where we have to go. For that, we need data. If we have a data gap, we have to collect more data. Therefore, it's our whole responsible to collect, analyze, and uh, dissemination data. Uh, not only dissemination, we have to share among us, not only the government itself, with the development partners, NGO, civil society, and other agencies, private sector, we have to share our own data to get the more results, more achievement. Therefore, we have to establish the system, how to collect the data, share in data, and provide in data in line with the 2030 uh, development agenda. Therefore, uh, our responsibility as a government, we can't do everything, but we need support from the development partners, uh, civil society, private sector, and other agencies. We have to work together to achieve the uh, sustainable development goals. Therefore. Uh, as a team, uh, we have to work uh, all the partners. Uh, and also, uh, as a policy maker, making body, we need data. We have to identify the issues, current issues. Uh, the, the, since poli uh, politicians are here, they also take a policy decision on behalf of the country, 
uh, requirement and the people of Sri Lanka. Therefore, we need to collect data and require data, identify the gaps. Therefore, uh, to take a policy measures or after implementation policy measures, we need to evaluate, we want to monitor. Therefore, we require data. Therefore, it is through our, we have to work with uh, various agencies, uh, collect information. Uh, census department only support and assist us to measure the indicators, uh, part of it. But uh, we have to keep in mind our all the other government agencies, our responsibility to get required information and uh, it uh, share with the other agencies uh, to better betterment of Sri Lanka. Thank you. Uh, uh, Karen, can I ask you to... Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so let, uh, I wanted to touch a little bit about uh, the role of data um, in um, helping us um, understand the different factors within the SDGs that we need to consider if we are going to actually apply it. And Professor Munising has nicely set the stage by explaining how the human and the environmental factor must come together. This is the main reason that we are doing the SDGs, right? I mean, otherwise we can do business as usual and we won't have to worry about it. And in fact, it has taken many, many, many years of data for us to be convinced that the environmental challenge is actually uh, going to end up disrupting human well-being. So the idea that we must look for ways in which um, we can progress without damaging the environment is the most crucial uh, message of the SDGs. And of course, what we need to do with the data then is to see whether we can measure how we are transforming. So one, uh, one reason we need data is to show transformation. So how can we use data to show that we are growing without exploiting the um, natural resources? So this is one of the, the uh, big questions that the SDGs uh, put to us. The next one is again also something that was explained before, this idea of interlinkages. So all this time we have been very used to kind of looking at, you know, demographic health survey, uh, uh, we look at labor, we look at uh, census and statistics about populations, etc. So now we need data to tell us how are these things interlinked? So how does something that happens in one place affect another? So for example, if we take Go7 and we take energy, the decisions that we make on the types of energy, say we go for coal power or renewables, end up having an impact on the environment. So data is needed to actually show us what those links are and whether those links are uh, positive interactions or whether they are negative interactions and how can one enhance another. For example, if we take the idea of nutrition, we see nutrition as a domain of the health sector. But what about the contribution that comes from agriculture? The decisions that agriculture needs to make, not just on you know, how much um, 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 food security, but the types of food that, that are necessary and the investment that is made to grow those foods. We also need to think about the environmental challenges that will impact nutrition. So data is really needed to explain also about how these interlinkages take place. And then, of course, at the end of the pipeline to measure that. But of course, we then also need to be convinced that these uh, interlinkages are useful and necessary, that if we, data can also tell us whether that's going to give us bang for your buck, right? So where is it that we can invest that will give us better synergies? Where is it that we can invest to reduce the trade-offs. So those are also the, the value of data and the other challenge of the SDGs. We can still do this sectorally and we can hope that somewhere there are, there are you know, ad hoc uh, connections that are made. But I, I would think that it is much more efficient to plan it out in a way that already recognizes those links. Okay, my last point on the um, next big uh, point of the SDGs. 
leave no one behind. Um, and I mean, you know, you can think about all these categories, you know, whether they are women, whether they are children, disabled, everyone needs to be part of the, the equation. And this really is a huge uh, challenge. But also the, the challenge is also more complex because leave no one behind doesn't necessarily mean just those few that are falling out of the equation. Think about all the people who are just above the poverty line. We can't still think that their lives are secure and that their well-being is guaranteed. So our systems also need to make sure that they don't fall be below again. And our poverty line is really, you know, uh, uh, it sets the lowest. So our ambition, if you're going to move to a middle-income sustainable country, then also needs to think about those people as not getting left behind or not falling down again. Just as much as it is about capturing what is called the uh, invisible. So the people who are now, now not getting captured. The people who are not captured by national level statistics. So this again is the other challenge and I don't think this is, um, it's, it's not going to be possible to do considering that there are so many data collectors and so many agencies who are actually collecting data. So this idea of disaggregating and collecting more um, nuanced data is actually uh, completely necessary if you are going to not leave those people behind. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, just a reminder uh, also that these, I'm seeing questions coming in. You all are welcome to vote on the questions that are there on Pigeonhole as well. Um, and then I'll take some of those questions once they're done. Over to you, Mark. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I wanted to maybe outline a few uh, considerations from working with the Ministry of Health here on uh, the health and health-related SDGs, so SDG 3 and, and uh, other, other health-related determinants of health on both the production side of the data and some lessons learned uh, on uh, the consumption side or the interpretation analysis and use. And I think it was in July 2016, uh, the Ministry of Health organized here uh, a workshop on the health and health-related SDGs. And number one, there were a lot of data issues that came up, and I think this is applicable to all the SDGs. There's still uh, some lack of clarity on the definitions and uh, the data sources or the metadata associated with those. And so I, th I think we have to you know, really lock down uh, these indicators and recognize there are new indicators and uh, acknowledge, you know, it's okay. You might not have a baseline today, but uh, through surveys or other mechanisms, if you have two or three data points over the next 14, 15 years, that might suffice. And so we don't need to have anxiety because we don't have all of the indicators populated uh, already in 2018. Some of them might not be applicable either. Uh, we don't need to look uh, so closely at ambient outdoor air quality in Sri Lanka because it's not a significant issue compared to other countries, for example. So just uh, you know, realizing these data issues as a whole. Number two is uh, there is a global health estimate for a number of these indicators that's being calculated for uh, all the countries by different UN agencies and other uh, global entities. And so is that estimate valid? And how do we uh, dispute that with our national primary data uh, that is collected? And, and we have to uh, acknowledge there might be discrepancies and, and, and recognize that these global health estimates are a proxy until we have better data from primary sources. And the third on the production side is this issue as raised by Karen, uh, looking at leave no one behind. National averages aren't very useful for proper planning, budgeting, uh, and policy making. And maintaining disaggregated data or stratified data by uh, equity stratifiers like age, like uh, sex, like uh, wealth, uh, urban and rural, and so forth, so that we can target interventions appropriately for those marginalized uh, and underserved populations. And uh, in fact, within health, there's been uh, some work done to look at this more closely um, and uh, comparing uh, demographic and health, uh, health surveys, for example. Now let me switch quickly to the, the uh, consumption side or the interpretation analysis in use. 
And I think first and foremost is it's essential, as they are doing in health here, uh, mainstreaming these health SDG targets and indicators into the national monitoring and evaluation frameworks uh, and, and ensuring that these are uh, adopting the global definitions and standards and, and using these for uh, national decision making and support uh, is, is absolutely essential. So if there are still outstanding SDG targets and indicators that are lying there in isolation, they need to be incorporated uh, quickly into uh, the different sector strategies and plans. Uh, number two is uh, we are swimming in data, but how well are we in Sri Lanka doing proper interpretation, analysis, and dissemination of that data? We're going to learn more about some of the dashboards and other tools and techniques, but our, are our uh, plans and budgets uh, really reflecting the trends and, uh, and, and, and understanding the SDGs as a, as a mechanism for supporting decision making on budgets and plans. And then the third point I want to make is that uh, first and foremost, adopting the SDGs has to be for the purpose of supporting national uh, development, not to report to the UN. And coming from the WHO, I say that with uh, recognition that we, we have to ensure uh, member states are owning the SDGs. These are for your own uh, planning and, and budgeting and prioritization. And secondly, for uh, supporting, uh, understanding the trends as you are striving to achieve the SDGs. Uh, so I, I wanted to just lay out a few of those uh, considerations on those different sides of the coin uh, and, and just mark that in here in Sri Lanka in the health sector, uh, that uh, I think we're very excited about the progress being made here and how this is influencing other countries in our region as well because of the uh, outstanding work already here in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Mark, uh, for those comments. And thank you for the entire panel for your introductory remarks. Um, while sort of I've been going through these questions that are coming in, I wanted to first use my privilege as the moderator to ask a few of my own. Um, one of the things has been, you know, I mean, I think, Karen, you mentioned about leaving no one behind and how important that is. Uh, that is all well and good for, as a statement. Um, and we can say, yes, we need desegregated data. But what about the people that are not in the data? And how, what, what are the, some of the things that we can do to ensure that we capture data about this? Okay, so that is really where um, other means of data other than large national level um, data sets really come into play. And the need to actually look uh, very much more at micro level data, um, which is of course harder in the sense of um, you can't, it, it cannot be representative. Uh, but even if one person is having a deprivation that that requires to be addressed, I mean, you have to address it. Um, so the, the challenge really is of being able to have rigorous data that is telling a micro picture. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a number. It can still be a um, qualitative data set that tells you about a person's life. For example, someone you know that's an older lady who's working all her life, no social protection, still having to work at the age of 70, and she's living alone, so she doesn't get captured into a household. Um, so she gets left out of even samuti. But if you look at a very micro level um, data, which is also where the local level systems are very, very important, because that is really where you can catch uh, more people falling out than from a, a, a national uh, level view of this. Thanks, Karen. And um, I just want to roll back to you, uh, Mr. Kumarasiri. You had mentioned about the fantastic work that the DCS has done in terms of finding out where we are right now, which we will hear about in the next uh, session. Um, what I wanted to ask you is you, you had mentioned about a large amount, and that this question has come from the floor as well, a large amount of the data has to come from others outside yeah. of the DCS, yeah. right? And linking back to the earlier comment by the deputy speaker yeah. as well about um, how we have very good data at the local level, at the Gramanilladari level, and we need to improve the flow 
of that information back to the center. So this yeah. interlinking of data, not just between government agencies, but from the local to the center, what are some of the, what is some of the thinking in, in government about how to achieve that? Yeah, we, we have already discussed with the DCS and other agencies, and uh, we have already started the work how to link and how to get the data at the center and analyze and do it. Uh, just before we also discuss uh, with the DCS DG here, and uh, we have various levels data at the grassroots level, at the divisional district, provincial, as well as the national level. And we, uh, we are in the process of uh, de collecting data through the system and uh, identify the framework, uh, how to develop, and what he has just mentioned, the dashboard. Now we are in the process of uh, uh, preparing a dashboard to get the data uh, through online. Then the data will come through the various uh, channels uh, to the center, and then it will reflect where we are. And if we require more additional data, we have to uh, go back and collect additional data uh, to capture the balance requirement. Thus, we are in the process of collecting data and analyzing. And there will be a system we will establish. Uh, there was another question that came from the audience, which I'll sort of maybe change a little bit and ask both Mark and Professor Munisinger. This is a question that is very difficult to avoid in these uh, debates, is it? Why should Sri Lanka look to some international global goals? Why can't we have our own goals? Your perspective on that. Uh, you could start, yes? <clears throat> First, uh, let me just try to link up two points which Karen and Mark made, sure. so uh, the, the discussion is integrated. Um, you talked about health, Mark, and Karen, you stressed leaving no one behind, and I talk, talked about inequality. How does this come together in our report? Very much so. Because in our report, it is visionary because by 2030, we want to aspire to certain high things. But we have consistently said the flow is that every citizen's basic needs must be met. And for example, in health, our primary focus is on providing a basic health care, primary health care for everybody by 2030. After that, we can think of heart transplants and uh, organ uh, matches and all the other uh, advanced cancer treatments and so on. But first, the primary health care. It's true for all of the sectors. For um, example, in the agriculture uh, food nexus, and now coming to the question of data, uh, the, we need stratified data and we need disaggregated data. For example, if you think of inequality, uh, and let's uh, focus, uh, there is a geographic basis. Uh, there is, for example, the poor farmers in the dry zone uh, who are terribly disadvantaged. There is an income aspect as well, the poor farmers, the type of livelihood that it's farming community, the nutrition levels of the children, all of these come together when we think of um, uh, the plight of these poor uh, dry zone farmers when they are afflicted by climate change, drought, and all the other things. So it all comes together. But there is so much data that we can get really confused. So that is where the skill of the analyst, you, the experts, come in selecting the data and then identifying uh, the, sorry, the other way around, selecting the priorities, then what are the suitable indicators and targets, and then finding the data to fill those gaps. That way you can help the decision makers most, because decision makers can't focus on a list of 100 priorities. But if you give them three, then they can do it. Yeah, global indicators. I would argue that uh, first, uh, I worked on the Sustainable Development Goals myself, um, starting in 2012, and we had many arguments. I still feel that there are uh, too many 
indicators, uh, and it tends to be confusing. That's why it has to be localized and targeted for the country in particular. But the fact that some of the best brains on the planet have come up with this set of indicators, of, of goals, means that we should use that shortcut uh, for us to reinvent a new set of goals would be, I think, redundant. So this is a train that has already left the station. There's a lot of momentum globally and elsewhere on this. We can learn from the experience of other countries. But first, let us prioritize. Let us see which of these goals and which indicators and which targets are relevant for Sri Lanka. And that is our purpose. And then we can piggyback on the thinking that has gone on before. So it is very relevant to use the SDGs localized as appropriate. Thank you. Mark, you wanted to add a couple of yeah, things? Just, just to add and build on that. Um, so l let's differentiate between the goals, the targets, and the indicators. So cl clearly, uh, Sri Lanka, as a UN member state, has accepted and adopted uh, the, the sustainable development goals. However, within the targets, which there are still many, 169. Not all of them are uh, a global target. Many of them are to be declared and uniquely determined here, country by country, here in Sri Lanka. So there's a target setting exercise that needs to happen across all of the SDG targets, which is very unique to Sri Lanka. Uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, some of these indicators might not be applicable. And that's OK. Uh, I, I think you can actually have both. Is, is, is my message, and, and really uh, you know, use the, the target setting process to come up with a unique portfolio of Sri Lankan specific targets over uh, the next uh, many years till 2030. Thanks. Karen, you wanted to say a couple of things briefly. Uh, very quickly about the idea about whether we should adopt a global uh, set or should we have our own. Actually, in the run up to the SDGs, in when oh, everyone was talking about it, um, we ran a very, very small exercise asking um, a set of people who are very much more at the local level if they were given the opportunity to come up with eight goals for the next 10 years of the country, the, what would their priorities? And actually, uh, the, the amount of emphasis people were giving on this idea about a sustainable future was so strong. And it was really quite... Um, it, it was really very nice to see. One of the other aspects that came out very strongly was the need for a cultural dimension, which is actually something that is not in the SDGs. Uh, I mean, it's there. It could be there. But the idea that we must build on our own knowledge, on traditional systems, indigenous systems, was also one aspect that came out uh, quite strongly. And this was uh, before the world had thought of, uh, had come up or nailed the, the goals. Uh, but basically, I, I also do think that now uh, the cart has gone, uh, and, but that it does embed um, also the kinds of things that what we were also finding that people were finding as important. Good governance was, of course, the other one that came out uh, very strongly. So what they wanted weren't so much out of sync. And definitely the idea of the SDGs is not that we need to do everything, but that we certainly need to carve out something that is specific for us, that is about our own trajectory of development, and that we then report back in a way that uh, suits our purposes, and which it shouldn't be the other way. It should be about our own direction. The only thing is we have to bear in mind that the challenge is about development, that is about the environment, the social, and the economic. I think that logic uh, needs to remain in whichever set of uh, goals or targets that we take. Thanks, Karen. A um, couple of questions from the audience which I wanted to combine uh, and pose to our panel. One is, do you agree that data available in the databases are reliable? How can we achieve goals with reliable data? So this goes to the idea of how do we make sure our data is reliable. Uh, and there's another question which goes off your point, something that you had mentioned in your presentation, Mark, which was in relation to the use of proxy data. How do we sort of, you know, how do we use proxy data? Uh, and how do we also make sure that they're reliable? So maybe uh, Mark and... Uh, 
the, uh, the reliability data, yes. Uh, we have to get the accurate data, quality data, otherwise it's useless. Uh, we gather it uh, unnecessary and uh, raw data if it is not correct data. Therefore, we have to, because census department, they know how to collect the data. That's what we, we thought, we have to get their expert knowledge uh, to collect the, the real data, quality data. Uh, there is a question of uh, whether data is uh, quality or not, uh, that we have to uh, go little by little uh, to collect the quality data. We can't say all the data is not quality and not uh, accurate, but there are some percentage maybe they, that we have to understand. Mark? Yeah, so uh, your, your, your decision making, your, your evidence-based decision making is only as good as the quality of the data or information supporting that. And, uh, you know, it, it goes to, without saying that, uh, you know, if, if senior decision makers and policy makers don't trust the data, uh, then uh, it's not worth collecting and using and reporting. It, it's, I, I think this vicious cycle of, of health information, uh, creating the demand for quality data, producing that, and then using it uh, and, and, and maintaining that loop. So in the absence of uh, good quality data, uh, we do develop proxy indicators or use uh, global health estimates uh, just to ensure that we can at least begin to look at trends, compare across countries, uh, take survey data, uh, do some uh, manipulations with that data according to some standards, and, and at least show uh, progress with the best available estimates. Uh, but again, these are just uh, a proxy until that good quality data can be uh, available, and that requires supervision and quality checking and uh, you know, getting complete and timely data from those sources. And let me just give you a, a concrete example, and I'm going to be very open in full disclosure here. Um, so we have a global health estimate for uh, mortality due to uh, suicides and homicides for Sri Lanka, an estimate. However, uh, that estimate is not correct. You have nearly 100% uh, good quality data from your police uh, records because uh, all of these events are re reported. So we need to adapt and rely and, and, and trust the, the actual primary data that you have and are collecting and reporting that is complete and trusted and, and you know, remove our estimate and use your uh, nationally reported figure because that is better. And, and, and that's the process. I think we have to use the best available data where we can and use estimates in, in the absence thereof. Uh, thanks, Mark. And just to add on to that, um, based on you know, the, the comments that came, you know, I mean, you, you, may, you raise the importance of trust, trust by the decision makers, trust by the citizens in the data, and that leads to the question of how do we have uh, the civil society engaged in, in, in the data access and uh, any comments that you yeah. have? I was really going to talk about that because you asked about reliable data. But this becomes, among us experts, an esoteric exercise. Um, ultimately, if you want ownership, if you want to implement the policies based on that data, you have to convince the public. Uh, now, let me give you two quick examples. One is I've worked 30, uh, 25 years with the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN body, and we have done very authoritative work, which 99% of the world scientists agree with. But there is a 1% group of scientists um, who are influenced by, for example, the fossil fuel lobbies. And if you look at what is publicly available, the 99% and the 1% get equal coverage. So the public says, uh, who do we believe? Is global warming right or wrong? So there is a question of carrying the public with you. And then we come to the social media. Uh, you can see with the number of stories floating around in the internet and so on, that people are thoroughly confused. So our being convinced about the reliability of our data is not enough. We have to find a way of communication. And this is what the Presidential Expert Commission is trying to do. 
The third point is that we ourselves are guilty of um, sometimes uh, putting too much faith in our own data. For example, GNP is often touted as a major measure of progress of a country. But there are other measures, for example, like gross national happiness and well-being, which are much more, um, I think, understandable in a sense. People understand that uh, more. In a, so we have to see whether some of the data that we are producing and the indicators can be adapted to the common sense um, uh, things about people. And finally, uh, the question of global, globally available data. There was recently a study in Science, which is one of the biggest magazines, that Sri Lanka is the third or fourth biggest polluter of, um, of the oceans. This is completely wrong because it was based on a large data sample and Sri Lanka is a very small pixel in all the international countries. So we have uh, done some work in Sri Lanka which shows that that is not the case because there are not enough people in Sri Lanka to balance, for example, the pollution produced by India. So there is that as well, uh, which is the point that Mark made. So it is up to us to identify our priorities, identify our indicators, and come up with our own data so that we present a correct picture of what is sustainability in this country to our citizens and to the whole world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, please keep your questions in pigeonhole brief because it cuts you off after a certain number of characters. So I don't sometimes get the entire questions if I'm not asking them. Um, okay. Is there any plans, there's a question here about uh, whether to make all the data available publicly through a centralized place? Um, uh, I'm not sure yet, but uh, Maybe that's a question the department for the next is here, DG, uh, uh, he can answer, but uh, there should be some system uh, to communicate, sharing information uh, with the others. It can, can I build on that? Because I was yeah. looking at the number one question around yes. corruption. Because I think at the end of the day, you know, having full transparency and accountability of the SDGs and you know, the traceability of the data, uh, making it available through dashboards and accessible to the public uh, you know, is the way that civil society and the public can really keep uh, decision makers accountable. And I, that's the only way. And I, I think that's what's happening here already. And that's what, you know, most countries are prescribing to. So I, I think that's an, uh, you know, kind of an excellent initiative here with the development of SDG dashboards as a way to initiate that and avoid corruption of the data or data for decision making not based on the best available data. And we'll find out more about that in the next session. Uh, Chairman, a just a 30-second intervention. Sure. I think we have in the room, oh, he's just left, the Honorable Speaker who's responsible for personally driving the Freedom of Information Act in Sri Lanka. And we should pay tribute to that. That is what we are talking about here. Thank you. There's also this question of what, are, what and where is the role of RTI Act in terms of the collection of data? Any uh, thoughts, Professor Munisinga, or Mr. Kumarasri, on this, on does RTI have a role to play in this data collection for sustainable development? I've done a lot of talking. Let one of the others handle that. Is that the Right to Information Act? Yes, okay. Right to Information Act. Uh, yeah, that is good uh, uh, way to get the information. Uh, then uh, people know that uh, the people can get any time and request information from the various agencies. Therefore, we, we, believe we have to collect the, the reliable data, correct data. Once we publish or once we collect data, people can ask whether it is reliable or not, quality or not, then we are responsible. Uh, this is, in a way, it is good sign. Um, can I also just say that the role of the RTI should also be about accountability? that, okay, maybe in collecting data, that uh, data should be accessible. 
but RTI should also be about having different mechanisms of accountability, not only one system, but one that is also civil society uh, led, civil society driven, and that, you know, they, there tends to always be kind of like this polarized feeling of uh, one is right and one is wrong, and if you criticize one form of data, then, then that you are a blocker. Uh, but I think that is also kind of a mentality that needs to change because, you know, the whole point of sometimes science and uh, different uh, thought processes is that you should be able to question it. Uh, but in order to do that, obviously, the, there has to be transparency in how that data was collected. So in a way, when we are talking about these uh, dashboards, etc., there is also a real need to be transparent about how the data was collected so that when it's being interpreted, which is sometimes the fear of why data is not shared, because you don't want it used and misinterpreted, because you don't know the basis within which it was collected. So there has to be also mechanisms that help you deal with that kind of thing. This is really complex, right? And, and, and I believe that this is one of the main reasons why data is not shared, because you have to tell the assumptions. You have to be clear. You have to lay out uh, the conditions which in which the data was collected. You know, as we are going through this, I'm being held accountable by the audience as we speak as well, um, for not following. So um, I think, yes, the time is up uh, for this. I thought we had a little bit more. Um, thank you, everyone, for your uh, time uh, to share your thoughts uh, with the audience and give your valuable thoughts on uh, how we can make better use of data uh, in uh, policy making uh, and also to achieve the SDGs. Thank you, everyone.